Hi, listeners. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I intentionally took a break from the podcast this summer to be with my family and welcome our new three-month-old son. But to kick off the next 10 episodes, I have an exciting guest in store. As a reminder, the transcript of this audio will be available to read or download at liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. Also, please leave a review on iTunes if you appreciate these episodes. They make the podcast more visible. Finally, I've provided in the show notes of your device links to the subjects mentioned in this episode and a link in the transcribed audio. As many of you know, we interview corporate defense law firm leaders, partners, general counsels, and legal consultants. You are listening to episode number 11 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Enjoy a front row seat with law firm leaders, their partners, and legal consultants as we discuss life and leadership. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Patz with The Lawyer Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Elliot Portnoy, Global CEO of Denton's, which is the largest law firm in the world. As Global CEO, Elliot is responsible for management of the firm, which includes over 8,000 lawyers and numerous support staff in 66 countries and 153 locations. Elliot was key to the formation of Denton's during March 2013 from the combination of SNR Denton. Canada's Fraser, Milner, Cascarine, and Europe Salins, and since then have been in the middle of several other combinations and growth, which we'll get to. Prior to Denton's, Elliot, you took the helm and was the youngest chairman of Sun and Shine, Nath Rosenthal, at 41 years old since the firm's founding at 1906. And during September 2010, Elliot helped lead the merger of Sun and Shine with UK's Denton Wild Sap to create SNR Denton. Elliot, you received your JD from Harvard, a PhD from Oxford, being a Rhodes Scholar, and your undergrad from Syracuse. You're active in community service, particularly on boards of nonprofits and with Keen. Welcome, Elliot, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks very much, Chris. Very happy to, to join you. So let's just jump right in. I've really enjoyed, I know many people have just been watching the astronomic growth that's happened within Denton's and the progression of all the different combinations took place. And knowing that you were 41 when you took over as the youngest chairman at Sun and Shine, I'd love to just touch on some immediate advice. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give yourself if you were to take on and start kind of start that whole process over again with Sun and Shine at 41? Interesting question, and one that I actually think about uh, a lot is I feel very lucky that over these last 10 years, uh, I've been able to do something that many law firm leaders don't get to do, uh, which is to be part of the transformation and really remaking of not just one firm, but, but multiple firms. Uh, and it started with Sun and Shine, a firm with a rich history and wonderful people and tremendous values, but we've been able to continue to remake the firm. But when I look back on the first set of combinations and really the starting point for our growth, uh, I remember then some commitments that I made to myself that I still feel like I am maintaining uh, around the importance of staying very focused on family uh, I have three young kids and actually not so young anymore, uh, but uh, uh, three kids uh, to be very intensely focused on the community uh, and perhaps uh, most importantly, to ensure that I could build a team that had the same passion for what we were doing uh, because it's the sort of endeavor that one can't do singularly, but that really has to be part of a, a team effort. Yeah. So it sounds like you wouldn't necessarily give yourself much advice or different advice. You just really have stuck to your values for 10 years. Well, the, the world is dramatically different today for law firms than it was 10 years ago. But we had the good fortune, some might say vision, but uh, for these purposes, we'll just say the the good fortune to look over the horizon and see a set of trends developing in the marketplace, to have a set of conversations with our clients, and to be a step ahead of what was happening in the profession. And the result is that 
10 years ago, I feel like we embarked on exactly the right course to be able to create a, a better, stronger future, uh, not just for all of my partners, but frankly, for the next generation of people who call Denton's home. Just asking the probably the not so simple question, why did the firm become the largest firm in the world? Was this something you, you just woke up and realized this is what needs to happen? Uh, we, we didn't set out to become the world's largest law firm. Uh, in 2010, when we did the first significant combination, uh, which was the combination between Sun and Shine and Denton Wild Sap, we did so because we realized that our firm, full of some really outstanding lawyers, was largely indistinguishable from about three dozen other law firms in the U.S. legal market. And our combination target, Denton Wild Sap, felt the same way about their position in their market. And we wanted to create a very different kind of law firm, but principally a firm that could more effectively compete for clients and talent than others in the marketplace. Uh, so that was the first step. At that time, we did not plan, nor could we have imagined that we would become the world's largest law firm. We were simply ensuring that we were taking the action steps to be responsive to our clients uh, and a set of industry trends. The success of that first combination led to others, and over time, we became the world's largest law firm, but it was never our objective or our goal. Uh, we intend to be uh, the world's leading law firm, not the world's largest law firm. So I had a, a conversation with a legal consultant last year, and he had mentioned the combinations that Denton's have undergone and has noted other large global law firms eyeing this. Would you say, Elliot, that there's a race to 10,000 lawyers? Oh, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, to the extent it, it's a, a race, we'll win. Uh, but we're not in it. Uh, to get to a particular number. There really is no magic number. It's about ensuring you can meet the needs of your clients in all of the geographies, the practice areas and industries that matter. Uh, and what we've learned over the course of the last several years of pretty material growth uh, is that uh, there uh, is no limit there's no magic number, and rather that we need to just be slavish in our response to what our clients need. And our clients have indicated that they want a very different kind of law firm, a firm that has a different strategy, a different philosophy, a different approach. But in particular, they want lawyers who are in and of the community and all of the markets that matter to them around the world. And today, even as the world's largest law firm, there are a number of markets where we either don't have a presence or we don't have a strong enough presence and we intend to continue growing. So let's just do a little review for listeners to hear all that you and your team have been up to. So you mentioned the, the September 2010 merger that formed SNR Denton with the U.S. firm Sun and Shine and the U.K. firm Denton Wild. And the next one that you guys have done was March 2013, which created Denton's. And it was three firms, SNR Denton, Canada's Fraser Milner, and then Europe Salins. And then after that, it looked like January 2015, which I think was kind of the, I don't know if the word is shock, but it really sent shock waves, was the combination with China's largest law firm. And it's, is it Da Chang? Is that how you say it? Da, da Chang. That, that's da Chang. correct. Okay. And then I know there was still ongoing conversations with McKinney Long Aldridge, and that was wrapped up in June 2015. And then you had a combination with a Singapore firm in 2016, April. And then also in May 2016, you combined with a Colombia firm and a Mexico firm. And for sake of not butchering their names, I won't say their names, but all that information will be in the podcast. What an incredible ride. I have to ask, Elliot, what were some of your takeaways through all of that combination activity? Well, I would um, first note that uh, while, while trying uh, not to, to uh, be anything other than humble, uh, in that same period, we also uh, uh, grew in Italy, in Luxembourg, in Hungary, in South Africa, uh, and since then in Brazil and Amsterdam and Peru and Scotland. 
uh, we're, we're very fortunate that we've got an extraordinary team. Uh, combinations like this uh, are actually pretty rare in the legal profession. Yeah. And while Denton's has done more than any law firm has ever done, the reality is that about 98 or 99 of 100 conversations never actually lead to fruition. These are complicated transactions. You need to find a high level of strategic and cultural and economic fit. So most of the, the conversations we have actually don't lead to a deal. But we're very fortunate that the combinations you've identified, uh, the large ones and some of the, the more modest in size, all had similar features, which was a high level of strategic alignment uh, and uh, were infused by our clients identifying uh, a market a practice, a sector that they believed were critically important to them. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, um, all of the combinations uh, have been very good to our fundamental economics. Uh, in every part of the firm, this growth has led to our ability to serve clients we couldn't serve previously, uh, to retain clients that we may have been in jeopardy or losing, uh, and to attract and retain talent that we might not have been able to attract and retain but for the growth. So for us, it's really been uh, not just an extraordinary uh, journey, but it's been the fulfillment of our clients' desires, and it's allowed us in a period of exceptional competition and turbulence to create a far brighter economic future for all of our people. Elliot, I can't help but wonder if most conversations never come to fruition, what kind of deal team are you using, are you working with it internally or externally to manage those numerous conversations? How do you guys handle the volume? Well, it's an internal deal team. Uh, it is a dynamic, exceptionally diverse and talented team uh, based in a number of markets around the world. Uh, and that team really deserves all the credit for what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, while uh, my colleague Joe Andrew and I uh, often get the credit, the real praise goes to our team, uh, our team of, uh, of what we call our uh, global chiefs individuals who are responsible for some of our key functions, uh, our core deal team, and our regional CEOs who work very closely with us to be able to advance these opportunities. Um, and having done as many transactions as we've done, uh, we've gotten pretty good at it, and we're able to make um, early decisions about when we think the cultural or strategic fit may not be be present uh, and we'll withdraw from a conversation. Uh, but importantly, what maybe we're most proud of, Chris, isn't the number of deals or even the results, but that they don't leak. Uh, we keep them very private. There are literally uh, hundreds of law firms over the last five years with whom we've had conversations around the world. That's amazing. And in some instances, those conversations have been quite advanced, even gotten nearly to the point of a vote where we or they have decided or maybe mutually decided not to proceed and there's not been a leak. Uh, that's critical. We need to be able to maintain with complete confidence and discretion these opportunities. Uh, and unlike so many transactions that fail because word gets out to the media, uh, our deals don't. Uh, and that's made a really material difference to our ability to be able to advance those combinations which we've approved uh, to closure. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, it, it's definitely commendable because in today's age, that tends to happen quite a bit. Well, there are a number of firms, I'm sure you, you know them, uh, mm -hmm. that are on their seventh or eighth publicly reported merger conversation. Yeah. Uh, and the sad truth for some of those firms is that they may never be able to complete a deal because the market simply won't have confidence. Firms won't have confidence having a conversation with the leadership team because they don't believe it can be done confidentially and with real discretion. And that's vitally important to actually getting a deal done uh, when it involves lawyers. Yeah, yeah, I get that. You mentioned uh, Joe Andrews. I'd love for you to just 
tell me, tell us a little bit about your relationship and friendship with Joe over the years. Sure. Uh, Joe and I were were friends before we became partners. Uh, I was able to successfully recruit Joe to, to join me uh, at the old Sun and Shine firm. Uh, and he and I, uh, as friends and colleagues uh, in leadership, uh, developed the approach and the strategy and then executed on it uh, over these last seven years since the combination uh, with uh, Sun and Shine and Denton Wild sat. Uh, it's unusual because most law firms have a singular leader, and that leader very often has to look over his or her shoulder and uh, worry about uh, uh, who might be uh, mo- moving up behind them or in front of them. Uh, and it's often very difficult in the law firm context uh, to be able to build a team and be able to execute on an aggressive strategy as a single person. And Joe and I formed a team. We like to talk about it as the power of two. And we are able to together uh, advance the opportunities. Uh, it used to be we do everything together. It's a little harder these days with uh, 66 countries to cover. So we divide and conquer perhaps a little more than we otherwise used to. But having two people with complementary skills who come at issues and problems a little differently, frankly, allows us to make better decisions. And we are a, a unified team, which is very different than most law firms that just have a one person, typically uh, you know, one chairman or one CEO, and that's it. We've done it differently, and we think actually it's a best practice and one that really has helped us achieve our objectives. Yeah, that's excellent. That's tremendous. Elliot, let me have you step into the the shoes of others. If you were a managing partner of a firm, say a thousand or less, even down to a hundred attorneys, what advice would you give a managing partner exploring a merger or combination? What's like your top two or three anecdote advice for them? Well, I, I think... Um if the firm is already considering a merger combination, then perhaps the most important advice has already been followed. I think for those firms that uh, are not looking at opportunities to grow and follow their clients into markets that may matter to them, they may be at a disadvantage. But for those managing partners who are already doing so, I think the, the most important priorities would be first to find a firm that um, you can have discussions with who will treat everything as entirely confidential so there can be no leaks. Nothing can be more damaging, as we talked about, than those uh, premature leaks to the media that really can tear apart a partnership. Uh, The second would be to look for a, uh, a potential combination or merger partner that's got some experience getting deals done. Uh, as noted earlier in our conversation, these are complicated deals. Partnerships are not the same as uh, corporate uh, M&A transactions. And so having a combination partner who knows uh, how to integrate, how to get a deal done, how to get the necessary votes uh, can be really important. And then the third thing I think would be not to double down on your existing challenges. We see a lot of merger activity, a lot of combinations between firms that seem to have the same attributes and the same challenges. And that's uh, perhaps a short-term way to avoid a challenge, but in the long term, we think, uh, or I think what's probably most effective is to find a firm that brings you something you do not already have, whether it's geographic reach, particular talent, uh, or uh, different industry expertise. But doubling down on your existing complement uh, of attributes usually is not the uh, strategy for long-term success. That's great advice. And I appreciate you sharing that, Elliot. Let's shift to your competition. Now, when you're the biggest out there um, you may discover you have competitors you didn't realize that were there. I, I'd love to just ask you, in this competitive environment now, with a firm like yours, who are your competitors? Well, uh, in, in truth, 
our competitors are both law firms and non-law firms. So in the, the law firm world, we've got a set of global law firm competitors, uh, those larger firms that uh, are able to offer integrated client service uh, across multiple countries and geographies. Uh, that's always been part of our competition. Uh, we also compete with the elite law firms, sometimes smaller firms in every marketplace. Uh, but often what we're competing against uh, will be uh, legal networks, which are themselves uh, not integrated. It's multiple firms coming together under the banner of a network uh, to try to vie for work. But increasingly, uh, in markets outside the U.S., our competition is the big four, uh, where, as you probably know, uh, there are no restrictions on the ability of the big four to practice law in most jurisdictions around the world. So we'll compete for litigation or M&A work from uh, PwC or uh, KPMG or ENY in a number of geographies. Uh, and in the last few years, we found even more competition uh, from technology companies, hmm. uh, companies that are increasingly bringing artificial intelligence uh, and other innovation to the practice of law, uh, such that the competitive marketplace looks a whole lot different today, certainly than it did in 2010 when Sun and Shine and Denton Wild Sap first came together to create SNR Denton. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I, I had a feeling that there would be more than simply law firms out there to hear the, the public accounting firms competing um, and then the technology firms. Elliot, so you kind of gave us a high-level perspective on competition. Let's go a little higher, and let's talk about the entire legal industry as a whole. So 50,000 feet, what changes do you see coming to the legal industry? Give us like a five to 20-year time span. What should we be expecting? First, I think I, I know one of the, the hallmarks of the, the legal profession and industry is that there can be uh, different firms in the same marketplace. Uh, whether uh, in Washington, D.C., where I'm sitting today, or Kansas City, or uh, London, or Toronto, uh, following very different strategies, and they all will have some measure of success. The, the particular strategy we've employed has been very successful for us, but we don't suggest it's the, the, the right one for everyone, but it's against the backdrop of a set of trends in the industry that are inexorable and moving faster and faster. Uh, there is in the profession, not just in the U.S., but around the world, uh, stagnant demand. Uh, and if it's not stagnant, then it's declining. Clients simply don't need lawyers the way they used to. Clients uh, are uh, not uh, as loyal to a law firm as perhaps they used to be. They're using formal procurement processes, panel reviews, and the like, which results in clients consolidating and using fewer law firms than they ever have. Uh, legal project management is uh, very much uh, a, a trend that will reshape the way business is done. All at the same time, you've got these new law firm competitors that I, I mentioned earlier, okay. uh, like the big four, uh, cloud-based law firms. Uh, you've got artificial intelligence that is reshaping uh, the profession such that there are estimates that as much as 33 or even a higher percentage of work done by associates today won't be done by associates in 10 years. What will be done by uh, machines or computers? Uh, and when you put all of those pieces together, uh, at the same time, it's a serious threat to the way in which many law firms' futures uh, may uh, may un, uh, kind of uh, un, un, unveil themselves such that uh, for us, the action steps we've taken position us for growth and success going forward. But those law firms that are standing still, that are hoping that the market will return to the way it once was, I think are going to be in a very uh, shaky shape uh, and may well not make it uh, because all of those trends are, are moving faster and faster. And those are just the trends we know about. Uh, 
Uh, as is always the case, there'll be some unexpected twists and turns. Uh, but the result is that a law firm that isn't innovating, that isn't agile, uh, that isn't following its clients to where the clients need uh, it to be will be in uh, real danger. Yeah, thank you for that. I know there's been um, lots of changes in consolidation coming to the legal industry. Let me flip it. Let me invert it. I want to invoke Charlie Munger in this question and to quote Jeff Bezos, What's not going to change in the next 10 years, 10, 20 years for the legal industry? Well, I, I, I believe that the, um, the fundamental quality and reliance on lawyers uh, for a particular set of services won't change 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Uh, that, that focus on quality will remain unchanged. There will still be a set of elite law firms in every marketplace that will continue to be successful so that whether it's the uh, New York elite firms or the magic circle in the UK or the uh, uh, proverbial seven sisters firms in Canada, those firms will still be in existence. They will still be successful. Uh, that will be, uh, I think, a feature of the marketplace. There will still be small uh, boutique firms in jurisdictions all around the world, and there will still be large global players like Denton's that continue to have the ability to handle that high-value complex work that requires a multi-jurisdictional focus. It's everything in between those that I think is very much uh, at risk and in jeopardy uh, in this evolving landscape. Yeah, thank you, Elliot. Let's pivot to another thing Denton's has launched in May 2015, Next Law Labs. And is that a legal tech accelerator, business accelerator? It, it is. We were the, the first law firm to build and develop our own uh, accelerator, we would refer to it as a collaboration platform. Okay. Uh, it is uh, wholly owned by Dentons, uh, and we do a number of things with Next Law Labs. Uh, first and most importantly, uh, we collaborate with our clients. So our lawyers and our clients collaborate to develop our own technology solutions to problems that clients have in various industry and, and practice areas. Uh, that's the most important thing we do, trying to bring innovation to help solve clients' problems. Uh, but we also uh, make investments uh, in various technology companies. As you know, there's been a, a virtual explosion uh, in the legal tech sector, yep. and there are a number of solutions out there that rather than building it ourselves, we've invested in some of the leading companies. There are about a dozen companies last year that we made investments in, which give us preferential access to the technology, the software, so that we can then test it uh, and use it uh, with our, our, our clients. And increasingly, clients want a law firm that is innovative, that can actually not just do what has always been done, whether in litigation or in transactional or regulatory work, and Next Law Labs gives us the ability to bring something very new and different to our ongoing client relationships. Yeah, that's, that's truly exciting, and I continue to see some firms fearful and steer away from the, the technology that's changing the industry, and some of them I see are embracing them, and I think it's seems to be very important to me embracing it. Well, our, our clients are very focused on innovation. Uh, our clients partner with us, uh, with Next Law Labs, and that's what makes it a, a great success. Uh, we're able to use this collaboration platform to add real value to clients. Clients, it's, it's often said clients want everything better, faster, cheaper. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. They do want better service. They'd like to have greater value, but they're really looking for a law firm that wants to partner with them, invest in them, and bring best practices and innovation to the relationship. And Next Law Labs allows us to do just that. Yeah, that's very exciting. Let me, let me ask you this question, Elliot. What's life like being a global CEO of the largest law firm in the world? I, I'm um, I'm very fortunate. I have what I believe is one of the best jobs 
uh, available in in the the legal profession, the legal uh, sector. I, I'm able to help put together a new firm, a firm that doesn't always follow all the traditional rules, uh, that pushes the boundaries, uh, that really tries to be a little bit of a challenger brand, uh, and to do so in collaboration with clients. So I'm I'm very lucky. Uh, the travel is extensive, as you might imagine, yeah. uh, with 153 offices in 66 countries. I'm on the road virtually uh, all the time, uh, and that can certainly be um, be draining at times, uh, but it also is exhilarating when we're able to uh, meet client needs in ways and places we never could. We're able to attract fabulous talent that might never have considered joining the old Sun and Shine or the old Fraser Milner Cassegrain or Denton Wild Sap, uh, and that uh, that that makes the uh, the long plane flights uh, pale uh, in comparison to the upside. What's the most interesting place you've been to thus far? Uh, it would be difficult to point to a single uh, place. Um, I've got uh, some favorites. Uh, of places that that I spend a lot of of time uh, all around the the world, uh, but I'm I'm lucky I I can in a in a week be in uh, São Paulo and uh, Edinburgh uh, and then head off to Sydney uh, and end up in uh, Almaty, Kazakhstan, uh, and each of the the markets culturally is very very different, but what's uh, uh, what, what I'm very lucky uh, to experience is that in each of those markets, uh, we're often either the only global law firm in the marketplace or sometimes the oldest and most rooted. So I get the opportunity to see a place like uh, Singapore, where we are literally the oldest law firm in Singapore, through the eyes of a group of colleagues who have been there for generations who are deeply rooted. The founders of our uh, our firm in Singapore have streets named after them. Oh, wow. uh, and that's a very, very different experience uh, uh, in a place like Singapore, in China, where we have over 40 offices, or in Canada, where we have six offices, or here in the U.S., where we have nearly two dozen. Uh, each market's a little bit different, but in all of them, we've got really exceptional lawyers and professionals. And uh, I get the pleasure of traveling to meet with clients and meet with colleagues and try to help knit everything together. So I know that community service has been an important value for you. Talk to me about Keen. Why Keen? Why bring it from Oxford, England to the U.S.? Keen is very important to me. It's a sports program for children with disabilities that I founded at Oxford uh, when I couldn't find a program like it here in the U.S. Uh, we built it here in the, the greater Washington area. Uh, but it's actually less about me and maybe it says more about, about my firm in that in 2006, when Sun and Shine was preparing to celebrate its centennial, uh, rather than spending a lot of money on a movie or a coffee table book, uh, the firm uh, came to me and gave me the seed funding to be able to establish Keen affiliates in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and St. Louis and uh, a number of markets around the, the U.S. And Denton's continues to be one of the most active and generous supporters of Keen because while I happen to uh, place a really high premium on community service and community engagement. Um, Denton's does as well, uh, and that's been a wonderful ability to marry my interest in community service uh, with what I do for my day job. And Denton's has a, a long and rich history of pro bono and community service engagement, uh, and Keen is just one example of how the firm really uh, invests in the communities in which its lawyers live and work. That's excellent. We talked earlier and you had mentioned that you I can, and I can understand you may not have a lot of time to read, but here's another inversion question I'd like to ask. What books should be written, Elliot, that aren't written yet? Do you have any book titles that you think should be written? Well, of course, I hope someone will, will write about the wonderful journey that, uh, that we've had at Denton's uh, and the ability to knit together these extraordinary law firms. Um, I, I, I can't say that that I can identify 
uh, a book that needs to be written. Candidly, uh, in my case, I need to find more time to be able to, to read. I uh, just had a little bit of time off and uh, was able to begin to make a dent uh, in the pile of books that not only is on my bedside table, but fills up the drawers uh, uh, of, of that table. Uh, but uh, just made my way through Hillbilly Elegy, uh, which is, had been at the top of the list that, uh, of books that I wanted to read, in part because I grew up in West Virginia, uh, but in part because uh, I had heard so much critical acclaim, all of which I think was warranted. And it was uh, a wonderful read, particularly at a time people in the U.S. are wondering uh, why certain voting patterns developed the way they did in this most recent election. I know our time's kind of coming to a close, so let, let me ask you this question, being that it's our last question. What's the kindest thing anyone has ever done for you, Elliot? Um, I think maybe the most important, and I suppose it was, was kind, it certainly felt that way to me, uh, was the decision of the uh, the Rhodes Scholarship Selection Committee uh, to give me the opportunity to spend three years uh, studying and doing my PhD at, at Oxford. Uh, for me, it um, firmly established uh, uh, my outlook uh, as a globalist, as someone who believes that we are uh, better when we are inclusive, uh, when we don't have borders. And uh, for me, it was uh, very much a life-changing opportunity. It happens to be also where I um, had the opportunity to establish Keen. So, so many of my current passions and interests uh, come together, And uh, but for the kindness of that group that uh, saw fit to give me the opportunity to have a scholarship to study at Oxford, uh, I'm, I, I might be on a very different path right now, Chris. It's certainly an honor, and it's tremendous that you were, you were given that opportunity, and I can see why that would be such a kind thing. Well, Elliot, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. I I uh, was thrilled to know that you would be willing to do this. I know you have an extremely busy schedule and I uh, just appreciate all the, the story you were able to share with us. And it's exciting to watch what Denton's is doing. Well, I enjoyed it, Chris, and hope to continue the conversation in the, the coming months. Thank you, everyone who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or would like to recommend someone on the podcast, please email them to podcast at findthelions.com. If you like this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes. Also, please share a podcast with others via email or social media. To share a podcast, listen to more shows, or read the transcript of this audio, go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.